six. Yeah, am I, am I fully in? Excellent. All right. Ephesians chapter six. By the way, we've probably got maybe two more weeks of this study, and then we're going to move, I think, to First Peter. It just seems to be the book that's really grabbing my attention right now. And, uh, and it's great. By the way, in my, uh, it's interesting. In my in studying for different things and going over Genesis, I was going to miss over a section because I'm like, ah, oh, this section really isn't the point I'm trying to bring out, the point that Romans is making. And then, and then it's like God said, what's your hurry? This all leads up to this point. This is part of the, his life process that brings him to trust in me. I'm like, okay. I don't know if you ever get that way in your prayer life where you go, okay. But that's, that's just where I was. All right, are we there? Ephesians chapter 6? Ephesians chapter 6, and I'm hoping to uh, be in verses 10 through uh, 17. 10 through 17. We'll see how it goes today. Finally... Verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that she may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, one of the things that... Um, how many of you have ever heard this passage of Scripture before? Yeah. How many of you have even seen all the cool diagrams for this before? You know, all the great illustrations. And how many of you have sat through, uh, you know, a sermon series on just this thing that took about three or four months? You know, yeah, it, it, it happens, okay? And, uh, and people really magnify this. I, I want to say that, as with any portion of Scripture, we can dig and we can dig deep, and it can be, sometimes you just have to give up. I remember in my own personal studies, I was challenged with a thought about how deep God's Word was. So I decided I was going to take the smallest book of the Scriptures. Does anybody know what that is? Actually, one's even smaller. Second John. Second John, second John, all right? At least that's what I think. Maybe somebody's going to find out, you know, somebody will watch this on YouTube and go, no, you dummy, it's this. Okay? Um, but uh, second, uh, second John, none of us can probably even quote a verse from Second John. You know, it's not a very popular or something like that. So I decided I was going to read it once a day until God stopped showing me something different in the book, okay? After three weeks, I gave up. God was still showing me something every day, and I'm like, this is great, God, but I really want to look at other stuff too. And, but it was that thing for me that after three weeks, God was showing me deeper things in his word, and, and it's uh, inexhaustible. Now, in saying that, I think... Sometimes we, we like to mock other denominations or religions for doing so many things in vain repetitions and, and uh, such as um, some churches, they always pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be that. And it sounds just like that. And we go, oh, that's silly. Or sometimes I monitor when I pray. You know, how, how many, am I saying, you know, religious terms instead of saying, um? Like, um, and God, um, 
I go, and Father, Lord, Father, I pray, Father, that you would, Father, do this, Father. And, uh, you know, you kind of monitor it. And sometimes we do things weird in our Christianity. One of the weirdest things, not one of the weirdest things, but a weird thing that I see people do is they take portions of Scripture and they make it weird. Do you, are you guys old enough? I think you are at least old enough in your Christianity to remember the prayer of Jabez. Prayer of Jabez was a little booklet about a, a couple of verses in the Scripture and how this prayer of Jabez was changing everybody's life. And blah, 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 expand my borders and blah, blah, blah. And, and it really became almost a religion unto itself far beyond what even the Scripture was meaning. In the same way, I, I see some people with the believer's armor. And they do some weird things with it. I, one dear believer that I know says, you know, when, when I, they came up to me after the service, not here, but somewhere else. And they said, I love that you're talking about uh, the armor of God because you know what? Every morning when I wake up, I put it on. And I looked at her and I said, why are you taking it off? We've got to understand that when the Bible tells us things, it's not so we can have formulas. It's so we can understand who He is, what we have in Christ, how we can walk in Christ, and how we can get right with Christ. Those are pretty much the things of Scripture. And I want to challenge you, even though this is going to be very familiar with you, and some of you will have great notes in your Bible, and Josh is, I mean, uh, James has probably got in his Bible, you know, he's got a, a one that he can color in. He's probably got this cool Roman soldier of Jesus or something like that. But, in he's checking that out. <laughs> so, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, it starts off with a word, what's that first word in verse 10? Finally, what I like is, is he's a good preacher. He says the word finally, and this still isn't the final thing. After this, he's got another couple of subjects that he's going to go. He's, he's a true preacher, okay? He says finally, in other words, pay attention. It's, it's one of these, these Greek words that's designed to wake you up again. Finally, I'm, I'm almost done, but I really need you to pay attention to this because we're changing gears. Finally... My brethren, be strong, how? In the Lord. And in the power of His might. See, this is teaching us how to be prepared. Somebody once said, it's, it's better to be prepared than lucky. Or somebody once said, have you noticed that the luckiest people are those that are the most prepared? Those who, who seem to have studied and prepared the most, they seem to be ready when opportunities arise. We, we just finished the Olympics a little while ago. And when an athlete trains, when does he start training or when does she start training for the Olympics? That week? That month? Years. What's the, does anybody know what the world record for the 100 meters is? 10.1. It's, it's something ridiculous. I, as a matter of fact, I think it's broken 10 point. I think it's 9 something. 9.6. Okay. It's, it's, and by the way, we're talking about a half second. And it's usually like a half second between the winner and the loser. It's like the difference between now, now. That's, <laughs> that's the difference. But how long do they train for those 10 seconds? Years, 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 daily, hours. Uh, you know, uh, I'm one of those people that, uh, whew, uh, I'm, I'm a little short-sighted on things. You know, yeah, I, I'd love to be an Olympian, but I really like my McDonald's. I, I'd love to run a marathon, but it's so comfortable on the couch. 
the decisions we make in preparation will either help or hinder us for things that we say we want. Christian, if you want to be successful in battle, battles of life, in the battles of your Christian life, you have to start to be prepared. By the way, you, you were wondering what I was staring at. It was that light. I'm like, oh, we need a new light bulb there. That's, that's what I was staring at. And so it, it says in verse 10, how do we prepare? We, we need to become strong. How? Well, strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Now, I'm going to ask you, how can we be strong in his power and his might? This is where you respond. How can we become strong in that? Studying your Bible. Anything else? I'm going to tell you the biggest thing. Studying your Bible is it. But... You can have somebody who has studied the rules of football and understand angles and everything like that and the force needed, but until they're actually on the pitch, they're putting that into practice. It's just theory. The way we prepare is we learn to walk with God. And when I say this, I'm not trying to be weird. But we need to have the realization that God is with us just as real as any other person in this room. I actually, just so people don't think I'm weird, I practice this in private when I'm with myself, I actually have verbal conversations with God. I do. I don't pray, pray quietly, I pray out loud. And, and, and I'll even say this, I, and I say this because sometimes we're really worried about people getting weird, right? When people talk about the Holy Spirit, usually the people that talk about the Holy Spirit the most are weird about it. Am I right? Okay. And so sometimes in our good Baptist circles, so that we don't seem like we're weird, we kind of downplay the Holy Spirit. But I, I want to let you know, that my Bible teaches me that when I pray, I should expect an answer. And by the way, the answer is not just reading God's word, but the answer will never contradict God's word. Amen? The moving of the Spirit has got to be real in your life. And you're not going to learn that on Sunday mornings, Wednesday nights. These are things that we have to walk and practice and learning to be quiet. I challenge you to think, when is the last time you spent an hour continuously alone with God? It's hard, isn't it? And yet when Jesus spoke to his disciples in the garden, remember they fell asleep? You guys remember that? You know, he said, wait, wait here. I, I've got to go to the garden. This is one of the greatest challenges I'll ever have to wait here and pray for me. Good friends. And whoever just sighed right there did exactly what they did. <sighs> okay, Lord, we'll be right here. And he left. And what did they do? They went to sleep. And when Jesus came back, does anybody remember the words that he said to them? What? Could you not even pray for an hour? An hour? <laughs> When's the last time you spent an hour? Jesus is like, I'm not asking a big deal, just an hour. When our Christianity is little snippets, little pieces instead of a long walk, don't think that you're going to be ready when the warfare comes. Um, we were really blessed. Uh, I was able to take Dakota to Rome. I, you know, I like going to Rome. And uh, I want to do something really special for him. So we went to a gladiator school. Do you remember that, Dakota? And they taught, I mean, and, and what's cool is that the gladiator school, it's a real school. 
where uh, lawyers and doctors and all these things to they, they learn how to be gladiators <laughs> so that they can they can kind of shuffle off the cares of their businesses and things like that. And I, I had a, an amazing opportunity witnessing to the guy that ran this place. And, uh, and, and he said, these moves are going to be the same moves of the, of the gladius, of the sword, that everyone knows, everybody reads, and it's the same for everyone. But until you put it in practice continually, you won't be prepared for the battle. And we've got to learn to walk with God. We've got to learn in everything walking with God. We've got to learn to be quiet before God. We've got to learn to be able to listen. Verse 11 says, put on the whole armor of God. Put on is the idea of uh, putting it on once and for all. Um, other times, Paul will write, put ye on Christ. Are we supposed to take Jesus off? Yes or no? No. When it says put on, it's put it on once and for all. Put on the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Your armor of God is not a uniform that you take on and off. I'll just ask you a question. When during your day are you no longer in a spiritual battle? <laughs> All day. Uh, in uh, uh, when I did paintballing over at camp, I, I explained to people, look, your mask is going to get hot and it's going to be yucky and it's going to fog off, uh, fog up, but you just can't take it off to take a breather because that's when a paintball is going to come, hit you in the eye and replace your eye with a paintball. You have to be ready at all times. You have to be in the battle the whole time. You can't just be in the middle of the battle saying, man, this breastplate is just... Oh, it's still in my back and let me put it down for a minute. You've got to keep it on. And it says that we need to be, it says, put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand. What is it to stand? This is important. To stand is a battle ready position. In other words, when we have the armor on, we have to have our feet planted and ready. And we have to be sober and look at the challenge that's in front of us and be alert to everything that's around us. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. Without armor, you cannot stand. And it, what are you going to stand against? It says it in verse 11, against the wiles of the devil. The word wiles is a Greek word, methodia, methods. That's where we get it, or schemes. Anybody old enough to remember the old wily coyote cartoons? Who was he always after? Roadrunner, meep, meep. Yeah, okay. And the wiles, the reason why he's wily, because he's wily, he's always plotting, he's always scheming. And I know in the cartoon it's kind of buffoonish. You know, he's, he's trying to do different traps, different schemes that should seem to work. You know, he'll put a lot of bird seed down for the road runner. Then he'll fill it with uh, metal pellets. And then the road runner eats it all. And uh, then he's supposed to hold up the magnet and the road runner will stick to the magnet. And his methods, even though they seem buffoonish, they always seem to not work out. Christian, I, I just want to let you know something. To a certain degree, 
when we are doing things God's way, his schemes will not have an effect on us. This doesn't mean that the wicked one cannot kill a believer. We see that happening all the time, don't we, around the world, throughout history? But his scheme is not to see you dead. His scheme is to see you no longer trusting God. His scheme is for you to doubt. His scheme is to hit the foundations of your faith. That is his scheme. Then to have you dead, you're perfected. But maybe he can ruin you. Maybe he can cause your testimony to be ruined and stop others from trusting Christ. Maybe he can get you to doubt God's love or doubt the salvation, doubt God's ability to hold you and keep you. And you, you keep on thinking, oh God, oh, I'm, I'm so scared that I'm going to lose my salvation. I'm so scared. Listen, if my son was constantly around us, around his mom and dad saying, oh, mom and dad, please don't kick me out of the family. I hope I didn't do anything today that, that, that would ruin it for me. I hope he doesn't understand the value of being a son, does he? He will never appreciate our love, our care. He's doubting that. That's what the wiles, the schemes, the methods of your enemy, the devil, will do. He deals in stealth and deception. He's like a lion hiding in the tall grass, just waiting. By the way, who does the lion go after? The weak ones. If I'll even give it a little bit more, this is one of my favorite stories ever. At university, there's a, a gentleman from Africa, from Kenya. His name is Gabriel Kayungu. And Gabriel Kayungu said to me once, he said, Satan is a roaring lion. The roaring lion, he roars because that's all he can do. He's trying to frighten you. He's trying to get you away from the pack so that his minion, his pride can get you. But he himself, he's toothless. All he can do is make you fear. Oh man, that's good. Satan is about deception. Satan is our adversary. He is our enemy. And verse 12 tells us what that's like. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and power, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Uh, Dakota and Natalio, can I have you both come here for a minute? And I want you both over here. Actually, here, I'm going to have you right in the middle. Okay? I want, Natalio, I want you to stand here. Dakota, I want you to stand here. Face each other. Each of you take one giant step forward. Maybe a little bit further back, Dakota. All right, there you go. All right, now I want you to put both arms on each other's shoulders. All right, to the... Now, I'm going to ask you to push each other, so put your arms... Where, ah, okay. See how it changed? By the way, not only did their hands change, what else changed? Your feet. Immediately. Because you're having to do what? To stand. Now, I want you 
to push the other person to the wall. Go. Go. Stop. Stop. Wait, listen. They're laughing, but they're out of breath. How long do you think that went on? Five seconds, maybe. And what they were doing is that they were wrestling. Do you get it? All right, sit down. <laughs> I praise the Lord. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's the point. We wrestle. We don't fight against flesh and blood. Again, your problem is not other people. The people seem like they're the problem, don't they? Oh man, I could just get along in my Christian life if it wasn't for people. That's not. You wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. And that's who we wrestle. And these two guys right now, now very easily understand what it means to wrestle. Dakota, what would happen if just for a minute you just decided, okay, I'm just going to rest? You'd be on your butt. Natalia, what would happen if you decided, I'm just going to rest? You'd be on the wall. <laughs> Do you see why your armor doesn't come off? Do you see why you had to be prepared? By the way, were they prepared? In the beginning, yes or no? When I said, you're going to push each other, hands changed, feet changed, thinking changed. Right? Christian, you're in a spiritual battle and you're not picking daisies. We wrestle, we struggle. That's what the word wrestle means, struggling. That's literally what you two were doing. I bet you slowly your heart is, is coming down now. But it, I mean, that little bit, five seconds probably max, was tiring. Do you think you're ready, either of you, to be in an Olympic wrestling match? Not, I don't mean WWF jumping off, you know, Boot to the face, or I mean, just like proper wrestling. No. Those guys are in that for minutes. And all they're doing is waiting for one little moment where the other person's going to slip up. A wrestler will do his match 99.9% .9 perfect. But we don't applaud that person because that tiny minuscule of, of lack of, of execution caused them to be defeated. Christian, I'm just telling you, we're, we got to be on our game. But here's the point, and this is where you have to answer me. How many of you think you could be on your game 100%, 100% of the time? Anyone? So how does verse 10 tell you to be prepared? Not your might, not your power. And this is where so many good churches, good preachers are going to get it wrong. They're going to tell you, you got to do it. 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 And you can't. You flat out can't do it. But he can. And he will. Christian, God did not save you, give you the Bible and say, hope you can make it. He didn't do that. The whole thing about your Christianity is learning how to trust Him. Learning how to depend on Him. This is the point, folks.
When you, <laughs> I get contacted all the time. People, oh, I just, I can't do it. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. You get it. You can't. Yeah, but I blew it. Well, you, you blew it not because of what you did. You blew it because of what you didn't do. What do you mean? You're not walking with him. You're not clinging to him. That's not the valuable time of your day. It says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle not against the seen, but the unseen. And what's, what's interesting is the word against is one which actually begins to state military ranks. It's, it's, it's a military term. So when it says against principalities, against powers, against the rules of the darkness of this, of this world, against spiritual wickedness and high, these are different ranks. Please don't think that you're always being attacked by the devil. I would dare say probably none of you ever have been. Look, I know so many times, like, is, it's just a little shiny thing that has to get me distracted. Saying it's like, oh, I could get one of my underlings to do that. But the more I'm with him, the more I'm prepared, the more I'm listening, the more his schemes, his methods, the wiles of the devil is not going to be effective. Against principalities, these are uh, rulers, high-ranking demonic forces, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. By the way, rulers of the darkness of this world. I, I believe this is teaching, honestly. This world is not my home, amen? This is not my father's world, as the hymn would say. Who's the God of this world? Satan. Who do you think is telling the, the, the world governments what to do? Every time, please, please don't ever think that this is a Christian nation or ever has been. Never has been. The United States is not a Christian nation, nor has it ever been. Nations cannot be born again. It's individuals, right? Every government on the planet, according to the book of the Revelation, will be judged by God. Every nation. And it's the world's rulers, the world's thinking, the world's fashion, the world's whatever. And whatever goes around in this world, whether it seems good or whether it seems bad, just know there's other things behind the scenes that are moving. By the way, we're just going to go one more verse and then we're going to uh, go to the specific armor next week. In verse 13, it says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Does that sound familiar? Yes or no? Where did we hear that? Verse 10, right? Excuse me, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God, verse 13, take, a, take, uh, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able, able to do what? To withstand against the evil day. And having done all to stand, verse 14, stand therefore. How many times does it say, just stand, 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 stand? Now, there are going to be some people in this life that will never experience battles. That's because they're not in the fight. Draft dodgers <laughs> have great peace only because they've removed themselves from the battle. They're not interested in armor because they're not interested in the battle. Christian, you are in a battle. There is no exceptions. There are no exemptions. Look, 
you, you go in the middle of World War II, whatever battle, and you go to the Germans, hey guys, listen, I know we're in a battle. I'm not going to fight you, okay? What's going to happen to you? You're going to get shot. You may not be in a battle, but I promise you the enemy is. The most valiant and eager member of the war is going to be powerless, though, if they do not have the provisions God has given them for this warfare. And you know what? It's easy to be lax in this country. When's the last time you heard of a believer in this country being murdered? for being a Christian. When is the last time you've heard that it was accepted for the government to literally kill believers? Now see, this sermon might make a little bit more sense to some who are actively in a battle. But just because it looks like we're not in a battle, because remember, our battle is not against flesh and blood. Or battle is a spiritual battle. And it says that we have to withstand, we have to resist. What these two were doing were not just simply trying to advance, they were resisting the other person. And it takes a lot. It can't take a mental break. As a matter of fact, I saw in the beginning, Dakota had a little bit of a mental break and you started getting the advantage. I pushed him a little bit to help him. He's still my boy. <laughs> but it says withstand, you know, resist. Then it says to stand again. Don't give in. I love when... Uh, now... I'm, I'm going to try to teach you something. Baptists are not Protestants. I don't know if you know that. Historically, we did not, Protestants came out of the Roman Catholic Church, and the root word of Protestant is protest. I protest. Okay? Historically, we are not Protestants. But my, I love reading about the Protestants. And, and I know sometimes they got things wrong, and I think, because of everything that they're coming out of, I get why they, they got some things wrong. Martin Luther did not get everything right. Matter of fact, Martin Luther, when in... Is it 1517? October 31st, when he nailed the, his 95 thesis on the church door at Wittenberg? You know what he thought? It's like, whoa, hold on. We have these biblical differences. We'll just talk about them. And I'm sure once Rome sees what the Bible says, it's all going to change. And it was just the opposite. And at the Diet of Worms, he was asked whether or not he was willing to recant. to everything that he had said where the Catholic Church was wrong with what the Scripture says, if he was willing to say, guys, I made a mistake. And some people get upset at him for, for this. I don't. He said, can I have a day to think about this, please? This is a serious matter. Not just is his life on the line, even though they said it wouldn't be, but also... Maybe he wants to make sure he's right. But at the Diet of Worms, when the session opened again, they asked him again if he wanted to recant. And he said, unless I'm convinced by Scripture and by plain reason, and not by popes and councils who have often contradicted themselves, my conscience is captive to the Word of God. To go against conscience is neither right nor safe. I cannot and I will not recant. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. 
And it's that type of, I, I cannot recant. I, I, I can't do anything unless the scripture and plain reason tells me I can't do anything else because it's neither right nor is it safe. And he says, I have to stand firm. And Christian, you cannot stand firm for a number of hours, a number of days, a number of weeks, or a number of years because your wrestling does not stop. We must stand firm till Jesus comes. And if we fail, we don't lose our salvation. But the scripture does seem to mention that there is a loss of rewards. Now, very quickly, what are some major ways that the enemy is going to attack? He's going to attack like Satan did in the garden, half God said. He's going to impugn God's character and credibility. That's one major way. He's going to bring a doubt in your head. Maybe it's not whether he's real or not. Maybe whether or not the scripture is true. Uh, right now, the biggest bane in my existence, I told you today, is a document called the Book of Enoch. And people are like, this is supposed to be the Bible, and the Bible's not complete. And forget about any other argument. Hold on a second. The Bible's what? See, now we doubt whether or not we can trust what's in the Bible. And that's what Satan's going to do. He's going to cause you to doubt. Before a boxing match, Natalia, you like watching boxing, don't you? Um, your husband, Robert, likes to watch boxing. Do you ever watch it with him? No. You, yeah. But, but right in the beginning, you know, the two guys are swearing off, squaring off, they're nose to nose. What are they trying to do? Intimidate. Why? about to start punching each other. They're getting them to doubt, getting in the head. That's what Satan does. He gets you to doubt. He causes physical trouble. We talked about that. He causes doctrinal confusion and falsehood. Uh, the scripture calls those doctrines of devils. He hinders Christian service. He'll hinder you from doing what you want to do. And it causes you to be discouraged. He causes divisions in the church. He loves that. This church has a sweet spirit. And I know this church has had battles in the past. I know this. But you know what divisions do? Divisions make one third stay, one third go, and another third just quit. And then later on, you know what it does? It causes people to go be suspicious. He'll persuade Christians to trust in themselves. He'll lead believers into hypocrisy. What do you mean? I mean, where we're more interested in the outward than the inward. I, and look, this is not a thing about music, okay? But there's this young lady. She, uh, she was a Christian, and she had a, a Christian group that, that I, I think is pretty tame, okay? And another Christian looked at it, looked at the cover of the CD, and they said, you can just tell they're not Christians. Look how they're dressed. Why? They were wearing the devil's fabric jeans. And the judgment on the outward. Now, I, I do understand that clothes, outward appearance does say something, okay? I, and I get that. What I'm saying is that when we are more worried about the outward than the inward, there's a problem. 
because we are never going to be strong in the power of his might when we are focused on the outward. Leading believers in worldliness. And then leading believers to just flat out disobey God's word. I was talking with one Christian. I think he's a Christian. And there was something going on. And I said, but the Bible says this. And this is the response. I know the Bible says it, but I'm not being convicted yet of the Holy Spirit about it. So what? So you know the Bible says something. But you're going to continue until you get a feeling? <laughs> Reminds me of, a, of the kid whose dad said, put out the trash. But dad, I don't feel like it. The dad started taking off his belt and said, boy, if you're looking for a feeling, I'll give you a feeling. Church, we don't need a feeling. We need to trust and obey for there's no other way. So these are some of the schemes of the devil. I know I went through them pretty fast, but um, we need to stand in his strength, in his power, because he's the only one that can do it. Amen? Walk with him. Let's pray. Father, thank you uh, for, for your word. Thank you for what this says. God, I thank you that you've given us um, what we need. Father, I, I remember as a kid when people would try to bully me, 